Hey, dear listeners, 90 Day Fiance, let's watch. My name is Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. As I always say, everything I say in these videos is completely speculative based on very little information. Let's watch. Your family was a cohesive unit. Now it's all fractured. What happened? It happened. Problems have always been there. They don't just pop up randomly because there's another person in the room. Clearly there's something going on and it's been there and now it's just coming out. All right, so I've been wondering about that. What was the family like? What were the issues in the family? How, what was the divorce like? How were the parents attuned to all the children? And Libby is saying that it's there's always been issues and Andre just exacerbated it or was the catalyst or something, which seems highly likely given what I've seen. I can't know that, but I would find it hard to believe that Andre walked into a perfect family and then suddenly his presence caused all the problems that we saw. I still feel the same way as I did. He has his manipulative tactics that he uses to get what he wants, especially out of my dad. And, you know, I think he still takes advantage. How does Andre take advantage of your dad? Um, I mean, how does he not take advantage? Sean asks the best questions. It's a perfect question to ask. That's the constant refrain from Jen and Becca that Andre is this master manipulator, con artist, Machiavellian, you know, very manipulative of Chuck. And all I can see is that he's asking his father-in-law for a job and the father-in-law gave him a job. So if that's manipulation, then all of us who have a job manipulated our employers and were master manipulators. And Sean asks, okay, exactly how? And this is a question that should have been asked of these individuals a long time ago. How did he manipulate him? And if you have an answer to that question, then you have 12 different things, uh, this, that, that. Instead, the bastion of the, uh, what do I say, <laughs> evidenceless, the bastion of the evidenceless is to say, well, how doesn't he do that? Uh, that's not evidence. You, you know, in a court of law, you can accuse someone of murder, and then you say, "Well, what evidence do you have of this uh, of the plaintiff's guilt?" And you say, "Well, what evidence don't I have?" You know, that doesn't usually fly. My dad, he's asking him for a hundred grand. I mean, that's that's insane. Call it whatever you want. It's just asking them. How right. <laughs> So by that definition, all y'all are manipulative because I'm sure y'all have asked dad for something before and Chuck refused him. <laughs> and so there's that. Now, uh, what people aren't jerk faces for no reason, there's a reason. And the hypothesis that I have that I really have very little data to back up at all, so I don't know. A strong hypothesis though, is that all the kids feel neglected by their parents and are scapegoating Andre as the cause of that and are focusing on money as a proxy for love. How is that manipulation? You ask somebody for a loan. Because it was his and way And that person into, says no, that's not manipulation. It was manipulation. his way into the business. It was like- But he his, didn't even like, get the money. The well, I'm, I know, but what I'm saying money. is exactly. his foot in the door. Like, hey, can I have this money? No, but here, let me give you something else. So there's this thing that we call projection in, in common language, and I see clinicians using this word incorrectly as well. We uh, we'll see different definitions of, of projection, but in the psychoanalytic and psychodynamic psychotherapeutic world, projection is when we project a part of ourselves onto other people, something that we don't like in ourselves or something that we internalize that we don't like. So one thing that we also, and I, that's why I love psychodynamic theory is because it explains weird, inconsistent behavior in humans, because we have a lot of that. And the model is uh, such that when we inter so if you had a manipulative parent or you had a situation where you were manipulated to manipulate, if that makes any sense, you identify as a manipulative person, but you don't like to acknowledge that to yourself. And so you have to suppress it and section it off in your psyche and go into denial of the fact that you are a manipulative person and you resort to manipulation. And we don't like that about ourselves because it doesn't reflect well on our ego. And so we will project it onto other people. We will see it in other people when we are the ones, in fact, who are the manipulative one. You can be this way if you are abusive. You can say, 
uh, you can, you know, you are abused, you internalize the abuser, you become abusive yourself, at least internally, potentially externally, and you engage in intimidating behavior, high control behavior, put downs, unfair criticism, maybe even physical abuse, control, and you go into denial of that because it can't, it doesn't fit well with your idea of yourself. None of us like to believe that we're terrible people, abusive people in particular. And so we will project it onto the people like, other people are abusive, not me. I'm only this way because you're the one abusing me. And I wonder if that's what is happening here. Is that what you were doing? Trying to get your foot in the door? No, I get your foot in the door. Just say yes, Andre. Just be honest. I mean, how does any no. other person get just... a job? They go. Even if he was trying to get his foot in the door, who cares? <laughs> yeah. He's trying to befriend his father in law because he wants to get a job from him. Absolutely. And maybe he'll get along with his father-in-law. So by this definition, anyone who networks, anyone who tries to ingratiate themselves with an employer is manipulative and a terrible human being. When they interview and they ask for one. He wants to have his own business. He wants to get as much as he can out of my dad's business and then go off on his own and, you know, do whatever he's going to do on his own. I think that's literally what Chuck wants from Andre. I think Chuck literally is saying, I want to help him get on his feet so he can have his own business and he can be successful because he's my brother-in-law and he's the husband of my daughter. Uh, so what world does Jen live in that that's a manipulation and against what Chuck wants? Of course. You're gonna take those skills and you're going to go against my dad. No, I'm gonna. No. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna stop him in the back. And I feel no. like I'm, you know what I mean. Like uh, Chuck, no, I got to disagree with you on that, Jen. He's not gonna compete against me because he would lose. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't think? As I've been saying from the beginning as well, uh, they live in Tampa, I believe. There have to be hundreds of people who flip houses. So to say that Andre would be in competition is acting like there's there's. Chuck is the only, uh, you know, construction f slash flipper of houses in that town. I, I, I know that that's not true. So another competitor for Chuck isn't going to harm his business. And if it did, then Chuck's business is way too vulnerable and fragile. She's been that exactly. way her entire life. Right. So he's like defensive, like, well, Andre needs to earn a living too. Do you want to put up with this forever? Uh, absolutely you know, not. With dad and all Absolutely that. not. Maybe we should do something together. Yeah, well, I was going to say. We can, we can compete. I like that. We should totally compete against them. We would blow them out. Of okay, so I didn't realize what Sean was setting up. So I don't know if I show this, but Sean asked Chuck, would you believe it, uh, would you think of it as a huge betrayal if Andre were to compete against you? Which I find to be kind of, and then Chuck said, yes, I would consider that to be a betrayal. Now, I don't know what Chuck's interpretation of compete with means. Uh, because it wouldn't be rational for Chuck to think that that's a huge violation for there to be another family a business in town that they probably wouldn't ever cross each other's paths or interfere with each other's business. Anyway, I don't know that for sure, but I'm pretty sure that's true. And uh, so, that, so that's strange. So, but maybe Chuck interprets compete as some another business that is out to take business away from you, somehow trying to undercut you in some direct way. I don't think Andre would try to do that. That would be silly. And why would you do that? There's probably more than enough homes to uh, do the sort of thing in Tampa. Anyway, and then, <laughs> so they asked Chuck, would you consider that to be a massive betrayal? And then Chuck says, yes, that would be a massive betrayal. And they cut to this scene. So let's see what Jen and Chuck will say about manipulation and betrayal. So, but to possibly go out into business ventures with Becky, and if that means being his competitor, then you know what? It is what it is. And you're talking cool. about- So you're, you're... we're talking about betrayal here, but there you see it, that looks like betrayal. He would never do that. So as I said before, projection is a thing. When we are a certain way because we internalized it or we were socialized to do it early in life. And we don't like that about ourselves and we are trying to protect ourselves from acknowledging it. We will distract ourselves by projecting it onto others, maybe even manipulating other people to be that way. That's protective identification. And 
then we can see the problem outside of ourselves when in reality it's on the inside. Did you know that they had started their own business? No. That they were on the path to starting their own business? No, I'm shocked. What, so, is that loyalty? I mean, uh, okay, obviously, we, me and Becky were just pissed and we're talking and Thomas was there and he's like, yeah, what if you guys just do it on your own? And we're like, yeah, maybe we should. All right, that's not really an explanation. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I just find people's arguments and conjectures just, I don't know. So <laughs> they show this clip of her betraying the father, according to their definition, manipulating in some ways, I suppose, putting the father down as well, which I'll say is fine. If I were Chuck, I'd be like, fine, go off on your own. I, I, I wish you well. Uh, it's fine. Maybe in fact, when that clip came on earlier in the season, I thought, yes, this would be the answer to all of our problems, including theirs, mainly theirs, is if everyone was just in their own business, there wouldn't be any of this fighting anymore. And maybe they could just enjoy barbecues without all the fighting. Who knows? So <laughs> then everyone's like, wow, that sounds pretty much like manipulation and disloyalty and a betrayal. And then Jen says, um, you know, I'm trying to think of what she could have said that would have saved herself. She could have said something like, well, I only meant it in the moment, which I guess is kind of what she's saying, but she didn't say that. What she said was, well, Thomas suggested it and we said, yeah, why not? That's, that's not a very good uh, cover up, but I don't know. So what would we hope that Jen would say? Well, what we would hope that Jen would say, I imagine if this, this would be honest, would be, well, okay, Dad, you're right. I am being a bit of a hypocrite here. And I did say that. And at the time, I did think it. And honestly, I still kind of do sometimes. And I've been thinking it for a long time. Because there are times when I think, maybe I could do better on my own. But I will say, Dad, that I would much rather work for you because you're the best. You know all the stuff. And I don't know if I want to be in control, I don't, you know, and taking out all the risk. So um, I said that and I didn't really mean it and I'm sorry, but I will say that, I don't know, maybe in the future, if it doesn't hurt your feelings too bad, I, I you know, I'd say maybe she'll say something like that. Let's watch. Five minutes ago, I would have said, yes, absolutely. They're my sisters, but now I'm not so sure. It's fine. We'll kick her out and we'll compete with them too. we we'll get her, we we'll get rid of her slowly. Did you say we are going to get rid of you? Like, she's a, my she's a, val she's a valuable about? asset to my <laughs> You're company. You're going to get rid of me. What, you, what? As always, Andre, just say nothing. When you open your mouth, half the time you are making it worse for yourself. You are proving her point. You know, this is the first time he's probably ever thought of it. Yeah, let's get rid of her. Uh, let's let's compete with her. You know, we'll get rid of her slowly. I think he's joking. And to say that, they will take it literally, especially Jen, and it confirms their accusation of manipulation. Andre, you have a tendency to come in and totally bulldoze people's opinions and their jobs. And like, there's a boundary and you cross it every time and you need to learn how to like chill and step back. Again, I'll talk about projection. When we do something like bulldoze or uh, insert ourselves in matters that don't really concern us and try to overpower and scheme against and campaign against, Behind, behind someone's back, even manipulating things, trying to break up um, your sister's marriage, trying to influence your father against someone else in the family, and you are the bulldoze, then you might want to project that as a way of protecting yourself from acknowledging that you, in fact, are the one doing that behavior. You're not responsible for how you came out and tried to start right away. I had a smile on my face. You could have came out and not said anything and just sat your happy ass joking. down and then talked to everyone because we were all talking to each other. He got in my face. He stood up and got in my face. Okay. All y'all were like trying to cancel me like I'm the toxic one in the family, bro. You are then, the toxic yeah, one. How? How? So he was saying that last time, uh, Charlie, as well, that he's one being canceled. And now he's introducing this word toxic that he's being accused of. Is he talking about how the family thinks he's toxic or the internet thinks he's toxic? We'll also say that there's accusations that I'm seeing in the comments about uh, Charlie and Megan using substances. And I'll say, I said this in the comments video that I make every week about reading people's comments. I'll repeat a little bit of it right now, which is that 
it's hard to tell when people are using substances unless they're doing something really quintessential uh, as that in, indicates intoxication, uh, like alcohol intoxication. You can tell Jovi, for example, we've seen signs of alcohol intoxication a few times while he's on the show. But with other substances, it might be harder to tell sometimes, depending on the level of use, of course. And I'll tell you from, and, I, and I've worked in substance abuse treatment. Uh, I've treated people who were high at the time. And, uh, you know, and I've seen a lot of drugs in my life, <laughs> people intoxicated. And I'll say that my experience is such that when I saw Charlie's Behavior, I, I didn't see anything that in, indicated some uh, obvious intoxication uh, indications. Uh, according to that, you could say that Andre was intoxicated on something. I mean, there was, there was violence, there was aggression, there was erratic behavior, there was shooting yourself in the foot. So I don't know. Yeah, and now may, maybe some of y'all out there have special knowledge or you see you have your radar in a particular way that you can detect that. I'm not saying that there wasn't intoxication. There very well could have been on any number of substances, but there wasn't any overt sign. And there's a, a myth out there that when you use certain medication, certain substances, that it lends itself towards erratic behavior and violence. And certainly that can happen sometimes, but given what we've seen from Chuck, his behavior when he was in a altercation with Andre was consistent with behavior we had seen before. So either he is always intoxicated, which is possible, uh, but in all likelihood, the behavior was just the next you know, step up the ladder because we had seen Andre and Charlie just continue to go up the ladder. And uh, so I'm not saying he wasn't intoxicated. I'm not saying any of them were sober at the time. We, we did see alcohol involved, but I'm not, I'm not seeing like, oh, it must be because of this or 90% of the reason why Charlie did this was because of substances. And uh, because if, we, if, if that was the case, then what we would see is Charlie acting very different when he was sober which we would guess there would be you know, sporadic, uh, this and that. We would also see Charlie in this moment, if he was less intoxicated now, which we would hope that he would be, then he would be apologetic or just different. He would talk different or act different. We've, we've seen a very consistent personality and approach from Charlie. Now, so I wanna be clear, I'm not saying intoxication wasn't a factor. I'm not saying he wasn't intoxicated. I'm just not saying that, oh, it's this obvious, you know, example of intoxication on a substance. Oh, but Ow. look at your behavior, dude. Look what you're doing to your life. Oh, but what I wanted to get to was, he keeps talking about being canceled and, and toxic. And we did see, you know, this is why we're not inviting you anymore. This is why you need to get help. You need to talk to mom or some, I can't remember the, the specific things, but there seemed to be hints of this. There's been this ongoing, ongoing fight or concern in the family that Charlie and or Megan has a problem with something and the family is really concerned about that. We don't know that for sure, obviously, but there seems to be some indication. It breaks my heart. Jen, who do you think started that fight at the barbecue? I mean, honestly, Charlie came in with a chip on his shoulder. Let's just be real. You did, Charlie. I had a smile you on did. my face. I think uh, Andre didn't tell anything. Like, really, he just tell you to, like, sit down. Okay, so if we're going to play the blame game, they're both to blame, clearly. I, I, I don't think anyone can argue with that, that Andre and Charlie were both 100% to blame for the escalation that led up to that event and for the event itself. When you really watch what happened, Charlie comes in and says, call the cops. And that's not necessarily directed at, at Andre, but it's not a friendly greeting. And uh, immediately Andre says, sit the F down, you know, shut up and sit the F down. So Andre, you know, so Charlie comes in here, uh, Andre comes in here, and then Charlie says, you can't tell me what to do, which I just find to be one of the most inane conversations you could ever have. I mean, just grown men. So call the cops, sit the F down. You can't tell me what to do. And then, and then Charlie kind of walks over to his side, not super imposing on him, but a little bit. Andre stands up and gets in his face. So that's another escalation. And then Charlie puts hands on and, and then we are, we're fighting. So 
uh, and then you can even argue that uh, Charlie put hands on like this, and then Andre wrestled him to the ground, which you could argue as a further escalation from hand, because you know you you'll see dudes trying to puff up, and they'll they'll just grab and push and this kind of thing. It's another thing to you know head and arm someone and put them on the ground. So they're both to blame. I, both of them could have done a million other things to de-escalate, or at least keep it neutral, but they both decided to escalate. All right, well, that does it for that episode. If you have liked and subscribed and hit the bell and or commented below, thank you so much. If I could give a thumbs up to you right now, I would. <laughs> and everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.